Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. Yes, 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 ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. I'm on half the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, Mashal St. Patrick Hewitt, and thanks for joining me as ever for another conversation, another deliberation, another investigation, another procrastination. Now, but all but in all seriousness, um, the third round of the West Indies Championship has concluded. I want to say we're halfway through the tournament, but of course, there are seven rounds this year, so we're not actually halfway. But uh, we definitely had an interesting third round of the tournament. Again, some some names putting them, themselves forward, some performances that we have to kind of pay keen attention to. So, you know what? Let, let, let's get into it. This is going to be a quick one, but let's get into it. Let's chop it up uh, and let's have a look at the um, third round of the championship. Now, before we even get, before we properly get into it, let me just kind of give a synopsis of where each team is at. If you follow us on Twitter, um, at Carib Cricket, you of course will see us update the the, the, the table um, in in due course. But after the third round, West Indies Academy have won one and lost two, having beaten the Leeward Islands and then lost to Trinidad and Guyana. Guyana Harp Eagles have won one, drawn one, lost one. They drew with uh, the Red Force in an abandoned, effectively an abandoned game. Um, they then lost to the Leeward Islands and beat West Indies Academy in this round. The Leeward Island Hurricanes have won two, lost one. They lost first time up versus West Indies Academy and have gone on to beat Guyana and Trinidad. The Trinidad and Tobago Red Force have won one, drawn one, lost one. Drew versus Guyana, beat West Indies Academy and then lost in this round versus the Leewards. Uh, Jamaica Scorpions have won one, lost two. They beat the down bad CCC and then lost to Wimmer Island Volcanoes and Barbados Pride. The Windward Island Volcanoes are three for three, leading the way by a significant amount. They've beaten Jamaica, beaten Barbados, beaten CCC, and look very good for it, we should add. CCC have lost versus everyone. Will they win any game this season? They've lost versus Barbados, lost versus Down Bad Jamaica, and lost versus Windward Island Volcanoes. They weren't disgraced in this round, actually, and I'll get into that later, but no, oh for three. CCC and Barbados Pride have won two, lost one. They've beaten CCC, beaten Jamaica Scorpions, the two down bad teams, and lost to the Windward Island Volcanoes. So out in front, even without the official kind of bonus points and all that, we know that Windward Island Volcanoes are leading the way after three rounds, followed by the Leeward Island Hurricanes and Barbados Pride. We don't know the set order yet due to bonus points. And um, at the foot of the table, CCC. Um, along with whether Jamaica Scorpions or West Indies Academy. So let's get into it. Let's go to the first game I want to look at is West Indies Academy versus Guyana Harpy Eagles. Now, last time out, West Indies Academy lost to Trinidad and Tobago Red Force. And I said it was good that they'd lost. I know there's quite a lot of people rooting for the Academy and saying, you know what, this generation is done out. Let's look to the next generation. But I made a point in the last round of saying the West Indies Academy team will learn more from being humbled by senior sides than just swatting them to one side. And they've, they've lost for a second time in a row, this time by 221 runs versus the Guyana Harper Eagles. And they were well beaten. in the After the first innings, they were actually in it. Guyana were put in first, made 175. West Indies Academy made 162 in reply. But once Kevin Sinclair hit an unbeaten, what did he hit again? An unbeaten 165 not out. The game was done. The Harpy Eagles posted him 415 for seven in their second innings and then routing the academy by bowling them out for 207. There were some notable performances in there by the academy. Not notable in terms of bad boy performances, but it, it, it's worth noting that um, Joshua James I've got I, my jo- I've I've got a lot of stocks in Joshua James four for forty three uh, in Guyana's first innings. Ashmead Ned five for ninety seven against his actual island men um, in the second innings. And interestingly enough, Ashmead Ned is currently 
Let me bring up my stats. The third highest wicket taker in the tournament um, after three matches, 17 wickets at 18 apiece. So well done to the slow left arm uh, spinner. Is he spinning or is it just slow left arm darts? You decide. Um, and then in in the with the bat, Rashawn Worrell, uh, the Bayesian, 58. Uh, and Jordan Johnson, again, people know if you're um, if you're a keen follower of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, you know that I've got huge stocks in Jordan Johnson. Uh, he hit a nice 50 in the second innings, 54. People have to remember that Jordan and Joel Andrew are only teenagers in effect. Um, so a good 54 from Jordan Johnson in the second innings. Also under 19, starlet Isaiah Thorne, 4 for 49 um, in the West Indies Academy second innings. And of course, Kevin Sinclair with an all-round performance in the game. The 165 not out in Guyana's second innings. And then within the match itself, he took, I think he took six wickets in the match. Uh, let me just double check. I swear he took six wickets. He took, yeah, six wickets in the match as well. So a fantastic all-round performance by uh, from Kevin Sinclair. And I think the big talking point coming out of this match, the the kind of Joshua James, Jordan Johnson, Rashawn Worrell, uh, Worrell, sorry, um, Ashmead Ned, those performances notwithstanding, the big talking point is, of course, Kevin Sinclair. Now, Sinclair obviously made his test debut in Australia, hit a maiden test 50. And I put in our Discord chat, and I stand by this. We have to be very careful about what we determine Kevin Sinclair to be going forward. First things first, 165 not out is not to be sniffed out. What a knock. Uh, maiden, maiden century, I believe it to be, right? But Desmond Haynes himself has said in previous press conferences that he sees Kevin Sinclair as a batting all-rounder. Cool. I just hope that going forward, we don't pigeonhole Kevin Sinclair in that kind of rust and chase mould. And what I mean by that is because of, because of his ability to bat, I'm not saying he's a top six international batter yet, certainly is a number seven or eight, but because of his ability to bat, we risk, because I just know how West Indies think, we risk pigeonholing, Rustin, pigeonholing Kevin Sinclair as, right, you do Roston's job. You balance out our side and you be the spinner, the, the, the primary spinner, so we can, so we can um, pick a, a pace attack, right, without having to pick a frontline spinner. And I can just foresee a situation, certainly outside of Asia, where instead of going for Gudakesh Multi as the frontline attacking, and that's a key word here, attacking spinner we drop multi and play Sinclair instead because Sinclair can bowl and therefore you don't have to worry about putting a frontline spinner into the side and you just use Kevin Sinclair as your rust and chase type bowler now of course some people listening to this will go mash shut up Kevin Sinclair is significantly better than rust and chase okay cool whatever that's not my point my point is about the role he ends up playing when Kevin Sinclair first broke into West Indies colours back in 2021 as a bowler, so um, yeah, sorry, when he broke through, he was a bowler. He was seen primarily as a off spinner, right? He still was, he was still honing his craft, but he came into the side as an off spinner. The question people have to ask themselves now as we go forward, because there's no doubt that Kevin Sinclair will be a key staple of all West Indies Test squads for the in the going forward in the near future, what role do you see him playing? Is he a batting all-rounder who bats in the top six, who then balances out the side with spin, which means you probably don't play an attacking spinner? Or do you see him as supplementary in addition to selecting a good Akesh multi as an attacking spinner? Um, or do you see him as a seven and an eight, which means he is the frontline spinner, but because he can bat, he just buttresses the batting lineup at number eight. Interesting things to think about, but be up Kevin Sinclair. We can't sniff at the, what, six wickets and 165 not out. Let's see how he goes through the remainder um, of, the, of the domestic championship. Let's see how many more runs and wickets he puts up. At this moment in time, after three rounds, uh, Kevin Sinclair is the fifth highest run scorer. So that 165 has done a lot for his numbers. Bear in mind, he's only batted four innings. As everyone else ahead of him has batted six or five. So Sinclair, 241 runs at an average of 80, with obviously that big unbeaten century adding a lot to that. So that's the kind of key talking points out of that um, Academy versus Guyana game. 
we see how things will go when the when the domestic championship resumes because there's going to be a bit there's a two week break and the domestic championship will resume in fact it's not even two weeks it's two and a half week break Guyana's next game will be against Barbados Pride um and the academy will play Jamaica Scorpions um I need to work out where those games have been played. The, the Academy are definitely playing Scorpions in Antigua. I need to work out where that Guyana and Barbados game is being played. I'll come back to you. I'll look for that in a minute. Anyways, uh, moving on to the second game. Um, so, where are we? Yes, moving on to the second game, which was played in St. Kitts. Leeward Island Hurricanes versus the Trinidad and Tobago Red Force. So, uh, with that game, I need to bring up all of my notes that I've been keeping after each match. Enough note-making now. Here we go. So, the Leeward Island Hurricanes beat Trinidad and Tobago by four wickets. A good win there by the Hurricanes. And given the situation they were in after the first innings, it was a lot closer than the game had any right to be. Trinidad were put in first, were, in, uh, were put in first or uh, batted first and only made 1-3-7 in that first innings. A top score from Jai Gooley of 30, following up the century he made in round two. Um, and it looked to all intents and purposes after the first innings that the game was done. When the Leeward Islands Hurricanes came to bat, they made 318. Top score by Jewel Andrew. Um, we got uh, that youth man. <laughs> thing is, everyone's, a lot of people are now pretending they had stocks in Jewel Andrew before the Under-19 World Cup. This is why I love Caribbean Cricket Podcasts. You, we always keep our receipts. We were talking about Jewel Andrew long before under-19 World Cup. Go follow our receipts on, on Twitter. We were talking about Jewel Andrew. Under-19 World Cup comes. He hits a century. Now everyone's got stocks in Jewel Andrew. Come on, man. That's why you have to follow CCC. We're talking about my man from, from time. Anyways, Jewel Andrew showing he can play red ball cricket and not just lick the ball. 87 off 146 balls. There was only one other 50 in that Leeward Islands uh, first innings. That was from Kira, the established Kieran Powell with 65 of 101 balls. So that kind of puts Jules Knock um, in perspective. I'll just I'll see the fall of wickets. Um, and three, four, five. But yeah, because Jules came in at number six, to be fair. So that's how highly the Leeward Islands rate him, that as a 17, 18 year old, they're putting him to bat at number six um, in, in their senior setup. Anyways, he responded with an 87 and St. Philip four for 62, carrying on his fine wicket taking form. Now, when uh, when Trinidad came back into bat, you would have thought, OK, game's pretty much done here. Even if they pass the, the Leeward Islands Hurricanes total, it's not going to be by a significant amount. But credit to the the the, Trin, uh, the Red Force. They put up 342 in their second innings. Again, Jai Gooley top scoring with 64. Um, Jason Mohammed chipping in with a lot of players chipped in. Their whole top seven all got starts. The problem they had was no one went on for a big one. Bikash Mohan, 25, Cooper, 36, Gooley, 64, Mohammed, 49, Webster, 38, De Silva, 34, Hines, 34. So I think the Red Force will be on, will be um, upsets too strong a word, but they'll, they'll note that someone should have kicked on, given that they all got a start. Um, but again, Jai Gooley responding with a 50 after his century last uh, round. And this is what I want to see from someone like Jai Gooley. You have to make consistent runs, hundreds, fifties, fifties, hundreds, make it consistent. Obviously, Rakeem picked up wickets, three wickets in the second innings. Jimbo will keep doing what Jimbo does. Did anyone see his his diving catch or his caught on bold? But Jimbo keep doing what Jimbo does. Uh, three for 68. And then anyways, Leeward Island Hurricanes chase the, 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 the 160 odd that they needed to win, losing six wickets in the process, though. Uh, they had Casey Carty uh, to thank and Jewel Andrew again in the second innings. Carty opened, hitting 53 of 136 balls and Jewel Andrew 48 of 53 balls. Neither was, both were out by the time um, the, the, the Leeward Islands made the runs. But the point was those two essentially shepherded the Leeward Islands home. Kyrie Pierre picking up four wickets in that second innings for the Red Force. Now, like I say, Jewel Andrew, there'll be a lot of people, they'll look at that. They'll look at that 87 and they'll see the 48 they followed up within the second innings and say, yeah, yeah, we need to fast track Jewel Andrew. No, 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 no. Don't want to hear none of that chat. Let the Ute man just continue developing like a Ute man. Does that mean that when South Africa A, so West Indies A, forget, sorry, forget West Indies A and South Africa A. Let's go to West Indies Academy. 
West Indies Academy are supposed to be touring Ireland uh, to play the Ireland uh, Rising Stars team or Ireland Academy team, emerging team in May, is my understanding. Jewel Andrews should be on that tour, as should Jordan Johnson, right? Certain men need to be on that tour, and Jewel should be one of them. I don't know if that's how it's going to go, but for me, that's the next stage of his development. He should go on that tour. And then if you want to start talking about West, in, um, West Indies A, let's wait for that. South Africa A will come, according to Miles Bascom, when he came on our show, South Africa A will be touring the Caribbean to play West Indies A at the same time as the Proteas senior men's side are playing the West Indies senior men's side. So there'll be certain, this whole West Indies championship, Rather than people looking to say, oh, this man should play for West Indies, I think most people should be looking, looking at it as who should we be putting in the West Indies A team that plays against South Africa A whilst that test series is going on. And yes, we can maybe think about a, someone like a Jewel Andrew getting some exposure. Think about some of these promising youth men. Casey Carty is an interesting one. Made 53 in the run chase for Leeward Islands to win uh, the match. Most people, when they talk about Casey Carty, they always say, oh, yeah, Casey looks more like a test player than, than an ODI player. Well, whatever it might be, whatever and wherever you stand on that particular argument, I think there's definitely a case to say that Carty should be playing some 18 cricket ahead of any potential West Indies test call. Remember, Carty's also got a central contract. So what's the point of giving him a central contract if he's not also in test consideration? Anyways, let's move on. Um, Barbados versus Jamaica at Spina Park. Down bad Scorpions. Scorpions lost again, obviously. Uh, Barbados won by four wickets. Scorpions made them. Scorpions, in fairness, as down bad as I say the Scorpions are, they made Barbados work for it. So um, Jamaica batted first, underwhelming with the bat first uh, in first digs. Made 269. Remain Morris making the most of his recall. Uh, let me just check something, Remain Morris. Yeah, that's his second 50 of the competition after five innings. He's currently on, he's currently made 223 runs for the Scorpions um, at an average of 56. Far better than anybody probably expected from Romain Morris. Uh, but 92, 97, sorry, not out in that first innings of 269. Jamel Warrican again, doing what test players are supposed to do, dominating and beating up on the um, the, the domestic people. Five of 62 in that first innings, Jamel Warrican. Barbados pro pretty much won that match in that first innings, 389 in their first dig, and our test captain Craig Brathwaite leading the way with 142. If people go back and listen to the review I did after round two, did I or did I not say Craig has been here before, he's got through a bad stretch before, he will come good? Certain, certain man want to be on social media going, oh, Craig, Craig, Craig. Craig Brathwaite is the least of our problems. We know he knows how to find form. So forget focusing on someone like Craig Brathwaite. We know that he knows how to bat properly, how to regain form, and how to produce at the international level. If he's on a bad stretch, allow him. He'll find his form again. Let's focus on other people who seemingly find form for one or two games and then can't find it for a next 10. Okay? So allow Craig Brathwaite. Good to see him come back with a one four two. Derville Green, uh, top wicket taker for the Scorpions with four for 78 in that uh, first innings. Now, in fairness, I thought the Scorpions would be fried fish after that. But again, much like Trinidad did versus Leeward Island Hurricanes, they came back strong. Second innings, they made 292. And again, much like the Red Force, I think the Scorpions will be upset that several people got starts and didn't kick on. So... Uh, Carlos Brown made 35, Kurt McKenzie made 39, Leroy Lug made 43, Mansing made 54. Um, so there was four players in that top six, because Mansing batted six, who all got significant starts. No one kicked on. And so maybe Jamaica will look at that and rue that and say, well, we probably could have made more than 292 and really put the pride um, in problems to chase down the 170 odd they eventually had to chase down. Uh, Shaquille Cumberbatch, 5 for 46. I don't know much about Cumberbatch. So any Bayesians watching this, by all means, get in the comments below and tell me about Cumberbatch. I don't know much about that you whatsoever. Um, one of the one of the few players in the region where I, I, ain't got, I ain't got no receipts. I ain't got anything. So I can't tell anyone watching this who's not in the region. Can't tell you much about Cumberbatch. I'll wait for the Bayesians um, in the comment section to, to add a bit more. But 
again, 5 for 46, you can't sniff at it. So there's obviously something there. Let me see how he goes next round. I would assume he has to play off the back of um, make, uh, bowling, getting a fifer, I should say. Anyways, the Pride needed 170-odd to win. They got there with four wickets to spare. Russian Primus top scoring with 43. Pete Salmon, the pick of the Jamaican bowlers with three for 69. Not really. Uh, the only real talking point I wrote down coming out of that match, um, and it's similar. Let me go to it. It's similar to the point I made about a Jewel Andrew and similar to the point I've made about Jordan Johnson. Kevin Wickham. So Kevin Wickham made 63. Obviously, that was significantly overshadowed by Craig making 142. In fact, when he was run out for 63, Wickham and Craig were the ones involved in that run out. Um, you could say that Craig sold him down the river there, but whatever, right? Kevin Wickham is currently the third highest run scorer in the competition. 313 runs at 63. Um, a piece. He's got 102 50s in the competition after five innings. Yeah, I, I like that from the Ute man. I like that. That's what I want to see, that level of consistency from a Ute man. Not just scoring a 100, but backing it up with 50s. Kevin Wickham is a no-brainer for the next West Indies A squad um, that plays against South Africa A. Absolute no brainer. They'll probably take him to Ireland, I would imagine, to play um, in that West Indies Academy tour. But I'm not convinced Wickham needs to do that next. For me, the next elevation for Wickham is to play some West Indies Academy, uh, West Indies A team cricket. And the question is, would you make him do both? Both go to Ireland to play in um, quote unquote alien conditions and then go and play the A-team tour? Or do you think it's time to elevate him past academy level, just like he has done? Barbados have picked him up. He's not playing for West Indies Academy um, in, this champ in this domestic championship. He's playing for his home uh, franchise. Is he now beyond academy cricket level? And is it time to think about him in the West Indies A-team level? Let's see. So get in the comments below. Let me know what you think. But Wickham, Wickham for me was the, the kind of main talking point I noted. And of course, Jamel Warrican. We better talk about Jamel Warrican. So Jamel Warrican took a fifer um, in the first innings, five for 62 of 27 overs. And then in Jamaica's second innings, Warrican took two for 99 of 34 overs. As things currently stand after three matches in the tournament, Warrican is the top wicket taker in the tournament. 19 wickets at 14 um, apiece. We, we, we talk about Goodakesh Multi, we talk about Kevin Sinclair, but we have to put some respect on Jamel Warrican's name. He's leading the way. Does that mean that Jamel Warrican is likely to play on or likely to go to England as one of the key spinners? I kind of feel like Sinclair and Moti have the two spots for spinners. But if they were to take a third one in case someone like a Moti broke down, yes, you, you'd have to say Warrican is leading the way in terms of who's next off the rank if they want an additional spinner on tour or a re kind of reserve spinner should someone like Multi break down. Let's watch this space, though, with Warrican. Um, needless to say, the next highest wicket spin wicket taker in the tournament, other than Nashmead Ned, who won't be playing for West Indies anytime soon, is obviously Jimbo. Jimbo, 14 wickets at 20 apiece. Jimbo is always in the frame, um, but we can have that discussion about Jimbo um, at a later date. And then the final match that I want to just look at in the competition, um, if we can just get it up on my screen, Wimmer Island Volcanoes versus CCC. This was the most straightforward match of the tournament. Everybody with in, anybody with sense knew what was going to happen in this game. Wimmer Islands were going to deal with CCC and deal with them relatively easily. And that's precisely what they did. Uh, Wimmer Islands went into, no, sorry, CCC back first, made 204 and to be honest, the game was done from that point onwards. Once CCC, it was very unlikely that Wimmer Islands were going to let that position or let that advantage go once CCC had only made 204. And within that 204, of course, no one made a 50. Demario Richards made 46. Daryl Cyrus for surprising leading wicket taker there in that first innings for the Wimmer Islands, six for 72. And then Wimmer Islands, when they came to bat, 395. Um, Kevem Hodge 158. I can't remember if that was his highest ever first class score. I feel like it was Kevem Hodge 158, Sunil Ambris 120. 
the Mario Greaves took a five for, for CCC, but five for 142. So, I mean, okay. Um, but Kevin Hodge and Sunil, Sunil Ambry stealing the kind of plaudits for their massive uh, partnership and the kind of twin centuries um, in the competition. Now, Sunil Ambris is the sixth highest run scorer in the competition thus far. He has 237 runs, but he's only batted three times. Every person above Sunil Ambris in the top five, so Mikhail Louis, six innings, Jonathan Carter, six innings, Kevin Wickham, five innings, Chadwick, Waters, Chadwick Walton, six innings, Kevin Sinclair, four innings, Sunil Ambris, three innings. Now, Sunil has made uh, 237 runs at an average of 79, 100, 150. Um, and he's made them at a fair lick, 237 runs aggregate from a, a total of 269 balls faced. Let me just throw this out there. Some will say, if we're being completely and utterly subjective, um, sorry, if we're being, yeah, if, let's call it straight down the middle. Does has Sunil Ambris got enough chances at West Indies level? Because there's an argument to say he hasn't. There's a real argument to say that Sunil Ambris has not got the opportunities he's deserved, given he's only 30 years old. So Sunil's not even 31. He's 30 years old, right? Sunil has played six test matches for the West Indies. The last test match he played was in 2018 in Bangladesh. Yes, I know he's only averaged 15, but I'm just saying he's played six test matches and he's played 16 ODIs and he averages 36 in, in ODIs. His last ODI was in 2021, also um, in Bangladesh. OK, so this guy has played six test matches, averages 15, 16 ODIs, averages 36, hasn't played for West Indies in any kind of um, format since 2021, hasn't played for the West Indies in Test in six years. If Sunil Ambris, basically, I guess the point I'm making here is, if Sunil Ambris continues to put up runs, at the bare minimum, he should be playing for West Indies A. At the bare minimum, he's only 30 years old. We've got other youth men who are 30, 31, 32, 33, 34 playing for West Indies. So how is Sunil Ambris not in the conversation? I know there's that whole thing around COVID and injections and this, that, this, that. But the point is, Sunil hasn't played West Indies in three years, in any format, six years in Red Bull cricket. Is Sunil Ambris in the conversation? Yes or no? Some people talk about his technical deficiencies. But listen, Sunil, Sunil Ambris's first class career, he averages 33 in 70 matches. How with 800s and 1850s, how many other men in domestic cricket have a have a record better than that go find them and list them in, the, in list them in the comments how how many other men have that and that's just his first class record i'll say it again 70 matches um with an average of 33 800s 1850s and obviously man from other like cricket nations will say that's so average in west indies that's like gold dust that's gold dust stats in the west indies yeah in in his list a career domestically he's, he's played 68 matches he averages 37 how many men in west indies domestic cricket average 37 in list day cricket but we don't ever talk about sunil ambris as somebody who's in the conversation i know it's only 100 in list day cricket in domestic cricket but 1650s but again beggars can't be choose beggars can't be choosers in west indies cricket you know so anyway sunil ambris 120 Back to the match. Um, in the second and in CCC, to be fair to them, put up 315. But again, Jonathan Carter was the backbone of that with 94. <laughs> Do you know who got Jonathan Carter out? Sunil Ambris, LBW. <laughs> but um, Jonathan Carter, old man Carter, you know, 320 runs this season at 64 apiece, 100 and 250s. Jonathan Carter is 36 years old. And he's leading the way, not just for CCC, but is the second highest run scorer in the domestic tournament. Just saying. Um, so, anyways, Carter made ninety four to, to to back up the century he made in the in in the second round. Um, who was the pick of bowlers? Shamar Springer, two for thirty three. Shamar Springer's having a good time of it. It must be said. He's currently the fifth highest wicket taker in the competition. Fourteen wickets at eighteen apiece. 
Shamar Springer, West Indies A potential. We can talk about that much later in the competition, but I'm watching you, Shamar. I see you. I see you out here. And then obviously, Windward Islands needed 120 odd uh, to chase to win, and they did that very, very easily. Alec Athenay is the captain, uh, leading the way with 58 not out um, of 42 balls. Jeremy Solazano hit 42 not out. Uh, and they 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 won comfortably with Mario Greaves picking up another two, which was seven for the match for him. But a comfortable, comfortable win for the Wimwood Islands. Now, Solazano, let me just talk about Solazano. I spoke about him in round two. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Solazano is currently the ninth highest run scorer in the competition. 215 runs at 72 apiece. Only 150, but there's a level of consistency. Um, Again, he's had three not outs. So six innings, three not outs, 215 runs at 72 apiece. Everyone forgets that Solazano was picked to go to Sri Lanka. Played in that, was it the first test? Got licked in his head with the ball. We ain't seen him in West Indies colours ever since. When we're talking about potential West Indian openers, if not Tej, if Tej does hold a drop, no one's really mentioning Solazano. People are talking about McCaskey being being next off the rank. People spoke about Mikhail Louis just because he scored two centuries in, in the second round. Arguably, arguably Solazano's out here. He's out here. We talking about Jeremy Solazano, yes or no? I don't know. Anyways, it's something to think about. Anyways, people, so just, just so people know, obviously on our Twitter um, earlier today at the time of recording, I did tweet the top run scorers in the competition. So just so you know, thus far, Top run scorers, Mikhail Louis, 343 runs at 57. Jonathan Carter, 320 runs at 64. Kevin Wickham, 313 runs at 63. Chadwick Walton, 242 runs at 48. Kevin Sinclair, 241 runs at 80. And then in terms of wicket takers, Jamel Warrican, 19 wickets at 14. Jeremiah Louis, West Indies A, he's played for West Indies A before, 17 wickets at 15. Ashmead Ned, 17 wickets at 18. Ryan John, 15 wickets at 17. And Shamar Springer, 14 wickets at 18. Listen, ladies and gents, that's been round three. Let me know what you think about round three and some standout performers and who you're looking at in terms of West Indies Academy. Notice how I didn't really mention West Indies senior men's side. Because I'm not, and I'm going to do another video later or early next week looking at standout performers and what the senior side is actually looking for because i'm not really in round in these first three rounds i'm i'm not really identifying or have identified anyone who have said yeah you stood out come through into the senior men's side i ain't really identified anyone like that i think it's a stretch to go from these first three rounds and say yeah i found someone but i definitely found some west indies a um um potential recruits that i'd like to to look at a bit more closely when South Africa A come calling. But you may disagree. Come at me in the comments below, people. You know how we do. I'm Ashel St. Patrick Hewitt, one half the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Subscribe, like, share. You know what to do. Search Caribbean Cricket Podcast in Google. You'll find us everywhere, and the content will keep coming. Peace. We rule the cricket world. Now the rules. Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans.